The opportunity for transformation presented by the recent financial and economic crisis has already been largely wasted. The opportunity for insight, not yet. Insight today can help inform change tomorrow. The progressives have squandered their chance through the intellectual poverty of their response to the crisis. Bailouts, fiscal and monetary stimulus, re-regulation of finance, strengthening of the requirements that large banks must fulfill, enhancement of the power of government to monitor and to liquidate financial organizations, and some measure of protection for consumers of financial services. That is all they have had to offer. It is not good enough. Not good enough to ensure broad-based recovery. Not good enough to prevent the recurrence of similar crises in the future. And above all, not good enough to connect our interests in economic recovery and in the prevention of similar crises to our stake in the broadening of economic and educational opportunity for ordinary men and women. What's missing from the standard progressive discourse about the crisis? The first thing lacking in the present conversation is an understanding of how finance can and should engage the real economy in which goods and services are produced. Under present arrangements in the United States and elsewhere, production is largely financed by the production system itself on the basis of the retained and reinvested earnings of private firms. What then is the point of all of that money in the banks and the stock markets? Theoretically, it is to finance production. In fact, the vast preponderance of financial activity has only an episodic or indirect relation to the funding of the productive agenda of society. It doesn't have to be that way. We can innovate in the arrangements that govern the relation of finance to the real economy to ensure that finance serves the real economy instead of using the real economy as a pretext to serve itself. The second thing lacking in the established debate about the crisis is an appreciation of the link between redistribution and recovery. The United States pioneered in the second half of the 20th century the organization of a market in mass consumption goods. Mass consumption requires popularization of purchasing power which in turn depends on a progressive redistribution of wealth and income. After an initial bout of such progressive redistribution in the immediate aftermath of the Second World War, the United States underwent several decades of regressive redistribution. How then did the Americans managed to reconcile the vibrancy of a market in mass consumption with the stark increase in inequality, in part by putting a fake credit democracy in place of a property-owning democracy. A pseudo-democratization of credit made possible by the overvaluation of the housing stock as collateral. 
real recovery has to be based on progressive redistribution. And the redistribution that matters most is the one that is based on a sustained broadening of economic and educational opportunity. The third crucial absence from the established debate about the crisis is a recognition of the deepest cause of the crisis, manifest in both our present difficulties and in the subsequent halting and job poor recovery. The United States simply stopped producing at competitive prices enough goods and services that the rest of the world wants. But it continued to live as if it did produce them. Thanks to its reliance on a policy of easy money, on credit supported consumption, and on debt fuel trade deficits. It did so because it failed to give a socially inclusive form to the new styles of production that have emerged in the wake of the decline of traditional mass production. China has used its export-led strategy of growth as a way to evade the task of deepening its internal market, which requires massive redistribution among classes, sectors, and regions. Similarly, the United States has used paper money, foreign lending, and easy credit to evade the task of organizing an economy based on broad economic and educational opportunity. And what about fiscal and monetary stimulus, the favorite instrument of the progressives and of the vulgar Keynesianism that serves them as a guide? For many different reasons, it will be inadequate to ensure broad-based and vigorous recovery after a crisis and a slump of moderate or large dimension. If firms and households are over their heads in debt, no form of stimulus is likely to prove effective other than direct governmental spending, financed by more public debt or by outright debasement of the currency. As the fiscal situation of government degenerates, there will be the risk of a crisis of confidence in the credit of the government. As public debt increases, it will be resisted by all those whose interests and prejudices fear that such changes will weaken the position of capital in relation to both labor and the state. The stimulus will be cut down to size. It was not fiscal and monetary stimulus that took the United States and other North Atlantic countries out of depression in the 1930s. It was war. The massive wartime mobilization of resources, accompanied by bold institutional experiments in the ways that firms dealt with governments and with one another. None of this is reason not to support both the policy of stimulus and the effort to regulate finance. At the very least, to prevent the aggravation of the slump and to ensure some measure of recovery. At the very best, to design the regulations and the stimulus so that they foreshadow what we really need, a strategy of socially inclusive economic growth. What we do in the short term can serve 
as a down payment on our long-term obligations. Here are three main lines of such an alternative. First, begin to change the arrangements that govern the relation of finance to the real economy so as to enlist finance more effectively in the service of production rather than simply trying to curb its more obvious excesses. The best way to make finance less dangerous is to make it more useful. Introduce tax and regulatory changes that discourage financial activity that makes no plausible contribution to the expansion of output or to the enhancement of productivity. Tap the dormant potential of the country's remarkable network of local banks to help finance small and medium-sized businesses and use some of the vast store of capital in the private and public pension systems of this and other countries to do some of the undone work of venture capital, investment in innovative and startup enterprise. Second, work toward a sustained broadening of economic opportunity. Open access to advanced practices and technologies, as well as to credit, in favor of small and medium-sized businesses. Reject the choice between the two models of government business relations that are now available in the world. The American model of arm's length regulation of business by government and the Northeast Asian model of formulation of unitary trade and industrial policy imposed top down by the bureaucracy. Experiment with forms of partnership and coordination between governments and firms that are decentralized, pluralistic, and participatory, and encourage cooperative competition among small and medium-sized firms so that they can pool resources and achieve economies of scale while continuing to compete against one another. Third, Give the nation the educational equipment that it needs to render the talents of the people fertile. Generalize in the country an undogmatic problem-solving approach to education that teaches the student to use information. Teach every subject from at least two contrasting points of view. Establish a form of vocational training that is on a continuum with this way of teaching and learning because it emphasizes generic and flexible capabilities rather than just job-specific and machine-specific skills. And in a country that is large, unequal, and federal, reconcile the local management of the schools with national standards of investment and quality. It is also necessary to join town, states, and the federal government in joint bodies empowered to intervene in local failing school systems, to take them over temporarily, to fix them, and to return them fixed. Utopian, you say? Today, if someone proposes something distant from what exists, people protest. It's interesting, but it's utopian. If he proposes something close to what exists, they protest. It's feasible, but it's trivial. Are all proposals then to be derided as either utopian or trivial? This false dilemma results from a misunderstanding 
of the character of proposals for change. They should not be about blueprints. They should be about directions and first steps, here and now. Other circumstances aggravate the force of this false dilemma. We have lost faith in any large idea of how structural change takes place. We then fall back on a phony criterion of political realism, proximity to the existent. Moreover, our ideas and arrangements continue to make crisis the condition of change. The task of the imagination is to do the work of crisis without crisis. Imagination, imagination to the rescue. 